to um, Title IV Conference Roundtable at the San Luis Hotel. We're so glad you could come down to beautiful Galveston. Isn't the weather lovely? Yes. And be with you today. So let's just do a shout out um, from the different states people are at. So I'll just go around the tables if you want to tell us quickly your organization and uh, your state. I'll start in the back there in the corner. Texas. Welcome. <laughs> and your organization? Your Texas affiliation? State University. Oh, I am. Wonderful. Texas Wellman University. Oklahoma University. I see. I, I'm glad to see that it's not all segregated over there at the table. Yeah, you got <laughs> Oklahoma in there with the Texans. Okay. And um, just we'll go, I guess, Georgia. down this way. Georgia. Georgia. Yes. Austin State University. Oh, wonderful. And any other institutions Texas, there? Texas, great state. The Texas, States Austin. Texas, yes. Child Protective Services? Yes, Child Protective Services. The front S table? San Diego State, California. University of Houston, downtown. Up here? Arizona State University. University of Nevada, Reno. Oh. Behind? Texas State University. Children and Family, Arkansas. Arkansas, welcome. UTR Lincoln. Any other organizations that came in the back here? Arizona State University. And all from Arizona? Texas. Texas. University of Texas at all counts. UTL, UTL. West Texas A&M. Great. Texas CPS. All this Christmas. Corpus. CPS all El Paso. And this table in the middle? University of Houston, Great Campus. So I work for Education Project. Uh, University of Albany in New York. New York. Winthrop University, Rockhead, South Carolina. Anybody else from South Carolina? Is she alone? <laughs> well, <laughs> you're going to make new friends right there. Yes. Okay. Any other organizations there? This table here? University of Minnesota. Minnesota. How's the weather up there? Not like here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's a compliment or a is it because it's too humid down here or anyone else different? I have to say Cloud State University. They're new about Minnesota. All in Saint Cloud I say Saint Cloud State University and University of Minnesota. Oh, okay, wonderful. State and the university system in Minnesota. And front table? University of Houston, Great. And you're our students, right? We have sponsored social work students here today. So. Yay. Um, we'll start here in the front. Texas, 48th Street, Galveston. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't come far, Mr. <laughs> Professor Soli, did you? <laughs> That's children, this is children at risk. And Texas Family Protective Services. 
I think we just have hit about every major region of the country, and that's wonderful. That means that whatever happens here is going to go and reach out to every part of the nation, and that's wonderful news for child welfare and Title IV-E. I'd like to introduce you to my husband. First, I'll just qualify. If you weren't in Title IV-E roundtable this morning, I'm Dr. Noel at flores and I'm the executive director for the Center for Public Service and Family Strengths. And I explained this morning that I'm really just carrying on Professor Salih's torch. He uh, has been doing this conference and uh, also family preservation before that for years and years and years. And he'll be doing our closing keynote on Friday. So we're very happy to have him joining us. We pulled him out of retirement from three blocks away. <laughs> we came to him. So. Uh, but um, today I'm here to uh, introduce Dr. Flores, the fifth president of the University of Houston downtown, who has been an advocate for child welfare and for social issues for a very, very long time. He was, um, as a young man, out in canneries fighting for rights for female immigrant workers. He was with Chavez. He was doing child welfare, and he helped support the center and when he moved here from New Mexico where he was provost and interim president and also held a secretary of education position under Governor Richardson. Um, my husband, Dr. William B. Flores. Well, welcome. Uh, how many of you have been to this conference before? Most of you. Uh, you know, it's been Elvin and I were talking, it's been going on for this year's 23rd year in different locations and sponsored by different institutions. But uh, it represents, and, you know, Elvin, by the way, uh, was one of the people, Dr. Salih, or Elvin Salih, was one of the people that, that actually helped put together the federal legislation that authored for me and brought it into existence. It's a memorable uh, time. Um, I, since all of you have been here before, you know the great spots nearby, including, I suspect, uh, the Summa Bar, that some of you are here. <laughs> uh, but you may not know that, you know, here in, in Galveston, uh, this is a, a, a city of, of great disparity, of uh, great wealth and great poverty. Uh, there has been you know, you can be here at the boardwalk and, and there, or just right down the street, and people from all over Houston, from the uh, Texas area, will come here to have a great time. But there's also been a history of, uh, of poverty, of exclusion, um, situations where of child abuse and, and neglect and many other things. Uh, the hurricane uh, left families displaced and also received families. So there's been dislocation, there's been uh, homelessness and dispersion. And uh, so uh, wherever we go, wherever location that you might be in, um, there's always a need for social work and for the intervention of social workers. And so uh, I want to congratulate you and thank you for all you do. Uh, in our university, uh, University of Houston downtown, uh, Houston is, for those of you who don't know it or haven't been to Houston, it's the fourth largest city in the country. And uh, when, I, when I moved from New Mexico State to the University, I was provost there that I'm up in Santa Fe in uh, uh, higher education. And I came to, uh, to, to Houston, people said, why would you leave Santa Fe? People leave Houston to go to Santa Fe. <laughs> and at, trust me, uh, the day I left, it was from, from, it was 63 degrees, beautiful. The sun was out. I could hear, uh, you know, birds, feel the breeze, and I got off the plane at night <laughs> at, at Hobby Airport. The doors opened. I felt like I, I was in a sauna. <laughs> and uh, that's that's Houston. But we we also have a very very diverse. City. One of the most, in fact, the New York Times. Recently, in looking at the census, called Houston the most diverse city in America. 
over 100 different consulates, 94 different languages spoken. Uh, one of the most, uh, you know, we have a large portion of African Americans, Hispanics, many people from all over the world. It's a, a global city. And UHD is one of the few universities in the country that looks like the city that it serves. We are, uh, our, our student population is 39% uh, Hispanic, 29% African American, and everybody else. Uh, this last weekend we had a commencement exercise, including social workers that we graduated. Uh, but we had the youngest person who graduated was 19 and the oldest I think was 69. And my first year there, the youngest person who graduated was 17 and the oldest was 71. So we, we have a complete, you know, uh, interesting connection with the city. People that work full time and maybe take one course a semester for many years, as well as people run out of high school that go directly to UHT. But because we're in the downtown, we're also right next to the heart of where most of the homeless live, where there's a lot of, of, of drugs, alcoholism, substance abuse, where there's, there's problems. We get a lot of the foster care kids who are aged out to come to our school, or homeless kids that, one of them that I was speaking to uh, a week ago, who, you know, are the train stops, the metro stops right in front of UHD. And it was recently extended going further north, but that would be the stopping point. So a lot of the homeless would ride it at night, back and forth, and uh, they, they'd get out at UHD maybe in the morning, and uh, wash up in our in our one of our restrooms. That's where they would where they would wash up, get their coffee in the morning. And one of this, the the young guys I was talking to told me, he said, you know, I kept looking, but I would get up and I I'd, I'd wash myself and I have some coffee. And I looked across and there's a jail. And I looked downstairs and there are people sleeping underneath the bridge. We're going to the restroom underneath the bridge, and I thought. You know, I've got the possibility of that life in the jail, this life living under the bridge, or this life here at the university. And that day, he was at the register. And so that, when I see that, and I see that, you know, the, the, the kinds of things we do at the university, it makes me really proud. And when I hear the stories, the research you do, and I, as I come to these, this conference, I hope that you'll, you'll talk with each other across universities, across states, engage, find out about the research people are doing, the service they're doing, because there's so much innovation that is going on in social media, right here in this room. We want you to share, learn from each other, write about it, um, publish it, definitely. We want to help you disseminate as well. And, uh, you know, the, the university also, because of Elvis, has a journal of family strengths that, that we, we publish as, as part of this. And hope some of you will, will publish articles through that journal. But the key thing is, I come here to learn. And I, I, and I consciously and, con and constantly, uh, I'm, I'm always listening to your stories and what you are doing. Because uh, and even though I'm a president of the university, I gain inspiration from it and lessons from it. And I want to thank you for it. And now I want to, so, oh, I wanna, she wants, I, I was going to introduce someone. Yes. No, no, no. I just want to give you a thank you for taking oh. a day out. I twisted his arm a little bit. <laughs> you don't need to give me something. This would be polite in front of the people. Okay. <laughs>
too, I was going to say that. One of the, and again, you know, uh, not to do a husband and wife thing, but Noel will be presenting on uh, some re uh, research projects on homeless, on, uh, on the homeless youth in Houston. It's done jointly uh, with UH and UT Health Sciences Center, and they have done a, uh, they've done focus groups all over Harris County, and so she'll be sharing some of that results. And I've been having a chance to hear some of the tapes or read some of the interviews, and it is tremendously moving. But it is my pleasure to introduce uh, a friend, colleague, and someone that I work with uh, uh, through, the, through UHD, uh, both as a partner, and then we, we work together on a lot of different activities uh, between UHD and uh, Children's Present, but also uh, because he has given his time to be on our advisory board for the Master's Nonprofit Management, and he's also uh, teaching for that group making a real difference in what I think would be a, a tremendous program for Houston and, and really since it's online we're getting people from other areas as well. Um, Bob Sanborn, Dr. Sanborn, is President and CEO of Children at Rest and um, he he is, uh, when, when you think in, in uh, Houston about children and you you want to know some data about it. You think about Bob. You think about children. You look forward to their luncheon when they present that data uh, each year. Uh, he's got a radio show where he, uh, which he hosts, and he brings people from all over uh, Houston. Uh, uh, that's what he Which he co-hosts. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he is. Uh, He's launched a public and policy law center, the children, also the Children at Risk Institute, and the Center to End Trafficking and Ex Exploitation of Children. He recently received Advocate of the Year Award from the Houston Area Association for the Education of Young Children and the Seeds of Hope Award for his work to end poverty. But in addition, the work that, that Bob has done and the work that children have done has also informed public policy and resulted in changes in law. And uh, I think that, that but when you get a nonprofit that's active and is engaged, uh, it's, a, it's an honor to, to have Bob as a friend and a member of our advisor for the Bob's happy. It's always great to follow a wife and husband team, right? <laughs> How's everyone doing? Good. 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 So I had lunch outside, Mandy and I, the co-host of the radio show. We had lunch outside by the pool, and uh, it was really very nice and uh, sort of luxurious, right? And it's sort of the work that we do to be able to come and have lunch by the pool and be able to see the ocean. And uh, I grew up in Puerto Rico, and uh, I grew up in a family where no one had ever gone to college, and uh, and as I progressed through school, I had a number of teachers that helped me along and said, hey, Bobby, you really need to think about going to college. And and I went to college, and I went to Florida State University was where I did my undergraduate work. And for me, it was like this utopia. You know, I hear with this small group of people who wanted to learn who were like me. But I always wondered, you know, why did my brother and sister not go to college? Why did all my friends not go to college? And none of my family sort of understood going to college. And uh, I ended up going to Columbia to get my doctorate, Columbia University of New York City. And for my family, it was all, why is Bobby still in school? We don't understand this. <laughs> they didn't understand the whole idea of higher education. But throughout my education, and then my subsequent career in academia, I worked at Columbia and then Rice University, and then was the dean of a college up in Amherst, Massachusetts. Throughout that career, I was always very interested and how does someone get out of poverty? How did someone like me uh, leave my family bonds, if you will, and, 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 and do something different and go to college and go to Columbia? Uh, and so that was always really interesting to me. And so when I came to Children at Risk 10 years ago, it was really important that we study and we figure out how does that work? And one of the things, I talk all over the state of Texas. We have offices in Houston and in Dallas. And we spent a lot of time in Austin passing legislation around children's issues. And 
one of the things that I'll often start my speeches with is, is I'll say, it's really interesting, as you meet parents all over the state of Texas, and, and you guys have met a lot of parents, and, and this is really true, isn't it, that when you meet first-time parents who have uh, children under the age of two, they're pretty sure that child is a genius. You ever figure that out? They're, they're pretty sure that your first grandchild as well, you're pretty sure they're a genius. And then what you realize, and I realized this before I ever had uh, our daughter, is that when you get to teenagers, parents then are like brutally honest. Well, he's not the sharpest tool in the shed. I really love him. And I was always amazed at that, until I had a teenager. So that, that you can be brutally honest. And in some ways, children at risk is like that brutally honest parent. We travel the state of Texas uh, being brutally honest about what's happening with our children in the state of Texas. What is that snapshot? What does the data show? We're nonpartisan. Sometimes Republicans love us. Sometimes Democrats love us. Mostly a lot of people hate us for our data. But the idea is that we're telling the truth. What is going on with children? And so uh, when, uh, when Noel asked me to come up here, Dr. Flores asked me, uh, I was, I was uh, very excited to be able to sort of do a little bit of a comparison of what's happening nationally with children and what's happening with Texas, because Texas uh, is really the future of America. When we look demographically at the state of Texas, what we see is that we are a picture of what America is going to look like uh, in a number of years. One out of every 11 children born in America is born in the state of Texas. Right now we have, uh, I think the next slide, so we have almost 7 million children who live in the state of Texas, yet 60% of those children are low income children. And a lot of people, it's, in Texas certainly, it's sort of amazing for a lot of people because we think of ourselves as this very wealthy state, yet we have one of the highest levels of child poverty of any state in the nation. And what's also unusual is that when you look at, there are eight states that have higher levels of child poverty, but they're sort of the states that everyone makes fun of. And so Texans are sort of like, well, why would you, know, would you put us in that group? Uh, and, and yet, well, that's our next Mexico would be in Texas. Yeah. <laughs> in Texas, we don't even know New Mexico exists. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's sort of the thing with Texas, right? We're like our own country. When we go to Austin and we propose legislation, we can never use another state as an example. I mean, that's very important for us. It's, it's all about, this is what the research shows with work in the state of Texas. But we have a lot of children in America, a lot of children in Texas, too many of them are growing up in poverty. When we look at the breakdown, and you look at Texas right now, the key factor I want you to see is that 50% uh, that Latino. 50% of our children are Latino. And by and large, those are second and third generation Latino children. And so these are children uh, that are growing up in poverty, uh, whose parents desperately want their children to be successful. But this is sort of a reflection. This is the fastest growing group. And all across the country, even when you look at the 24% Latino, that are, that are in the, in the country, uh, this is a very young group. Latino parents are very young. They're having children. Uh, and so this is the group that's gonna grow fastest. By large in America, our Anglo group, our white group, our black group are a little bit more aged out. Latino group, very young, still having children. When we look at uh, that socioeconomic diversity, uh, we, the, the thing that we, that's very clear for us is that too many of our children are growing up in poverty. And what's very important about this is that when we look at every other factor affecting success of children, the common denominator is always poverty. So really it's not about, I mean, you do all these things, but it's all about how do we make sure that children end, uh, get out of poverty. And if we want to end poverty in America, if indeed we want to do that, the easiest way that we can break that cycle is to start with their children, right? If we can grow those children out of poverty, if we can move them while they're a child uh, from one economic class to the next economic class, that's, that's the great hope for us because that's what we have to do. And that's what we're not doing right now because people do not understand that when children are growing up in poverty, you have to do something different for them to be successful. You can't just keep doing the same things and expect different results, right? Um, 
another thing, a lot of people will often point to family diversity, and if you listen to media pundits, you would think that every child in poverty is, is in a single mother family, right? And I think what's important to understand is that, uh, you know, 66, 65 percent of our, of our children are living with two parents. In Texas, a child living in poverty is more likely to have a two-parent family. Both parents work. Uh, both parents uh, are, are in jobs that don't pay very well. And we need to understand that it isn't always a single mom. The single mom is an important thing, but it's not uh, sort of the assumption because too many times when I go out and make the speech, people start talking to me, well, isn't it all about making sure that we keep our families together? Well, yes, it's very important to keep the families together, but it's not the majority of the problem. So when we look at implementing effective public policies, and for us it's real important that at the systematic level, we try to change what's happening so that systematically and public policy-wise, we change what's happening. We're looking at things like quality education, <coughs> making sure children are not hungry, uh, making sure the children are in good health, and making sure that we're keeping our children safe, right? And that good child welfare. So these are the important things. And when you look at those, talk a lot about education because historically in the United States the very best way to move children from one economic class to a higher economic class has been through a quality public education but for them to succeed education wise they're going to have to be safe they're going to have to be healthy and they can't be hungry and many times in this country and certainly in the state of Texas what we're not doing is taking advantage of all the benefits available to us to make sure that children are successful so Texas has a very low rate of families that use food stamps. Texas has a very low rate of making sure that children are getting their free breakfast and free lunch within the schools. So all the very essential things, all these federal programs, all paid for, it's not paid for by the state government, they're paid for by the federal government, all these programs to ensure that children are successful, many times are not even being used. We passed a piece of legislation uh, during the last legislative session in Texas where we had to go and we talked individually to state legislators, uh, state senators, state representatives about the idea that so few of our children were getting breakfast. And so we, we proposed a piece of legislation which was that if your school had over 80% of your children in poverty, that you would have to take advantage. You'd have to take advantage of the U.S. Department of Agriculture program to make sure that kids got free breakfast. School districts aren't paying for it, we're just saying, you have poor kids, make sure that they get fed. And we basically had to testify before the Agriculture Committee to say that we're gonna help Texas agriculture with this uh, to get everyone on board. And finally, it did pass with a lot of Republican support and Governor Perry, bless his heart, actually signed it. And, and now, starting this fall, a million more children in the state of Texas who were hungry before will now be eating breakfast because of this. She wants me to be there for color commentary, I will. So let's talk about quality education. Right now in our urban areas, not only in Texas but across the country, about half of the children who enter into the ninth grade will not finish. That will range anywhere between 40 and 60 percent depending upon the city, uh, depending upon the school. <coughs> in departments of education all across the country and in individual states their role is to make sure that they look good. And so we often don't hear about what these real dropout rates are. But one of the things that we tell parents often is just go to any high school, anywhere, count the number of freshmen and count the number of seniors. And you'll see this dramatic difference. And, and you can't explain it away by people moving to the suburbs because the numbers stay pretty static and it's all about kids that start the ninth grade that don't finish ninth grade. So this is a key problem. And what we figured out some time ago is that if we wanted to end our dropout problem in America, the best money that we could spend would be in early education and pre-K. And <coughs> we go to Austin, uh, we go around, <coughs> excuse me, around the state of Texas, and we talk about this 
And there still is a little pushback, but we think the tide is changing. We think that more people are understanding that if we can have quality pre-K programs that lead into quality K, one, two, and three programs, things are gonna be different for these kids. The research is real clear that kids who do pre-K, uh, pre-K three, pre-K four, these are kids that are gonna be significantly more successful. So if we're talking about quality education, one of the best things and best pieces of uh, investment we can do is making sure that the kids are going to pre-K. We also wanna make sure that, uh, that we have high quality early education. When we talk about whether it's single moms or parents that are working, what we find is that all across our state, when, when a mom and a dad are gonna to go to work, they try to find the cheapest place that they can drop their kid off, the cheapest, safest place uh, where they feel comfortable. And many times that's the lady down the street and she might have a lot of kids there, but in a sense what we're doing, what these families are doing, are safely warehousing the children. And things need to change in that regard because we know that if you live in an affluent household, everything that can be happening to make sure that those kids are learning, to make sure that the progressing is going on. We also know that the difference between an affluent child and a child who doesn't grow up in affluence, that by the time they reach five, there's about, they've heard, an affluent child has heard about 30 million more words, much more vocabulary. And we know that that is making a difference. So as we look at pre-K, we also have to look at the early childhood uh, part of this. Six to three percent of children aged three to four uh, living below the poverty level that are not enrolled in, in pre-K, uh, compared to 45 percent of those that are a little bit more fluent. In high school, the, if you look at all of our schools, about 22 percent of our high school kids are not graduating on time. Only about 25 percent of those students are college ready. Uh, but the other thing that we find, so the common thing that we hear is, why are school districts pushing this whole idea that we want more kids to go to college? And I hear public officials talk about this all the time. You know, maybe what we need to do is to have more vocational programs, and, and this is a really big push. And right now in the state of Texas, about 27% of our children do vocational education. And that's about right. That's about where it needs to be. But when we visit schools, one of the things that we see are a lot of kids, this is especially true of Latino children, children that should be going to college that aren't even thinking about going to college. And we, we see this, uh, well, we see it with Latino children, we see it with African American children, we see it with, with poor white kids as well. There's a lot of children that aren't even thinking about higher education that, that really should be thinking about. One of the things that children at risk does, that's what CNR is, children at risk, is we do our own graduation rate. Because the state of Texas, I think it was about eight years ago, we went to testify before the, the Senate Public Education Committee. And the state of Texas was saying that our dropout rate in the state of Texas was 1%. So we had 1% of our children were dropping out. And uh, we went and we showed how Texas at the time had 28 different reasons why you weren't a dropout. They called them lever codes. And, uh, and these little lever codes, any school could say, well, this student does not drop out because of this reason. At that time, it could be if a child became pregnant and left school, that's a lever code. They're not a dropout, they're someone who became pregnant and left school. And there were 28 of these reasons. Sort of like Paul Simon's 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover, this is 28 reasons why you're not a high school dropout. And so when you do this, only 1% of our kids were dropping out of school. So we began to put pressure and create our own graduation rate showing this true graduation rate. Uh, and the state is actually getting significantly close, closer to where we are. But when we looked at the most recent uh, class of 12, 80% uh, of the kids who entered the ninth grade uh, graduated. Um, so things are getting a little bit better, but we're still, this includes all the fluent areas as well. One of the things that we do, when we came up with uh, some of these dropout rates, we wanted people to understand and, and people to understand that, that these dropout problems were, were a challenge to us, but we wanted people to not just pay attention to, to just that there are a few bad schools and not their own. So we created these school rankings. And we do them every year now with the Houston Chronicle, the Dallas Morning News, the San Antonio paper, the Austin paper. 
And the idea is that in, in the state of Texas, at least, and I know this is true everywhere, we love rankings, right? We love to rank everything possible. And so we ended up coming up with these school rankings uh, that really were able to show who were the overperformers and who were the underperformers. These are the top high schools in the state of Texas. And if you look at them, they're really mostly magnet schools. And if you know anything about magnet schools, uh, they're basically selective. They're public schools that can be selective uh, and, and choose their kids. But what was important for us about this was that here are some schools in the state of Texas that were arguably some of the best schools in the country that were doing this very good job. And what's also different about magnet schools in the state of Texas and having lived in New York City and, and studied some of the magnet schools there, in Texas the magnet schools are incredibly diverse uh, with uh, economic diversity, racial diversity. So you go to the, the School of Science and Engineering in Dallas and it is about 40% African American, uh, about 40% Latino, about 20% white, uh, about 50% of the kids are economically disadvantaged. And as you go down the road to Bakey High School in Houston, the health professions, the highest number of African Americans who passed the AP calculus test are at Bakey. And so there are some great things that were happening at these schools, and we wanted to pay attention to this. These need to be things that are replicated across the state of Texas because these are examples, the very examples that we want of ways that children are breaking that cycle of poverty. When their parents are more engaged in figuring out what to do educationally with them uh, and choosing some of these schools, and that's what the ratings ended up doing, is that parents now begin to, begin to see not only a ranking, but each school is given an A, B, C, D, or F, and parents can see, what, how is my child doing? And for a parent, we work very closely with uh, Univision and Telemundo, uh, and so for a Latino parent in the state of Texas, uh, to be able to see, oh, my child's school is getting a C or a D, uh, and then to understand via Telemundo, via Univision, how do we change schools if we want to do that? This becomes an important factor in terms of getting parents engaged in the education of their child so that they can be a part, again, of breaking that cycle of poverty. Uh, these were the ones in Houston. One of the things as we look through, uh, one of the, we always look for the outliers of the schools. So if we go back here, uh, you know, a lot of magnet schools, and then if we were going to, the number eight is the first sort of comprehensive school in Houston. This is just sort of a neighborhood school Fort Bend County, very affluent area. And uh, as we started seeing some of these schools, we realized that there are a lot of affluent ones at the top. But so we, we, we always look for the outlier. Where was the school that was high poverty and high performing, right? So what are the examples of schools that are high poverty, high performing, the schools that are really making a difference in the life of children? And uh, we saw basically five factors, but one of them was a very key factor and it was time on task, academic time on task, amount of time that that child was spent doing academic work. And we quickly realized that one of the things, the shortfalls that we see here in the United States is that our school year is significantly shorter than most every other country. We have about 180 days in our school year. That's across the country. It's about 175 in the state of Texas. Uh, yet at Korea, it's 230. Uh, most developed countries are right about 200, uh, and that's a lot of days. That's a lot of academic time on task. And if you live in a, an affluent household, your parents are probably doing a lot of other things. One is they have higher levels of education themselves, so just interaction with them sometimes is, is providing a lot of that stimulus. Uh, but you're doing tutoring, you're doing all sorts of academic activities, but you're going to museums or fun museums, and this museum of science and all this stuff, and this is, this is part of that academic time on task. But until we lengthen our school day, or lengthen our school year, and increase that academic time on task, we're going to be behind. Even our most talented kids growing up in the suburban schools, if we had a longer school year, they would benefit from them as well. So what we found is that within those high performing, high poverty schools, they had figured out a way to lengthen the school day and to lengthen the school year. So they were doing things like high quality academic after school program, or before school programs. But here's the other thing that we found, that they were doing things like on Saturday, the principal was figuring this out and saying, we're gonna have teachers come to school on Saturday and we're gonna have tutoring. 
And if, especially if they're in the neighborhood, in an elementary in the neighborhood, the parents are bringing the kids. And so in a, in a, in a sense, they have created that blog of the school year on their own. And so every time we find these high performing, high poverty schools, we've figured out they've extended that school year, they've extended that school day. So that time on task is, is very important. Um, <coughs> we went to Austin last year talking about this. And uh, as we put together our legislative agenda, I said, you know, we really need to focus on how to do this longer school year. And I would say probably everyone we talked to said, well, it's just not going to happen in the state of Texas, right? It's too much money. And I said, well, can we at least begin the conversation? So we proposed a piece of legislation, which was that Texas would study, right? Someone said, well, we've already studied this. We know longer school days work. Said, yes, but Texas hasn't studied it, right? So we proposed that Texas study the longer school day, longer school year. And much to our surprise, everyone said, yes, okay, we'll study it. And it passed. There was a piece of legislation that we wanted to create dialogue, but indeed it passed. And Texas has now created an ex expanded learning council. Uh, the, the governor appointed a number of people to be on it. I'm on this commission. And the idea is that we're studying this longer school day and whether this works uh, in the state of Texas. Uh, some of the stuff you guys have heard of before in regards to uh, expanded learning. Um, when we look at the high quality schools, I've talked about more time on class, but we saw basically five factors. And the, the possible sixth factor is that especially in some of the elementary schools that we saw, we expect that most of those kids have gone through uh, a high quality pre-K program. But we also found that they had uh, teachers that had this really missionary zeal about being there and learning that were willing to give up their Saturdays from time to time. In every single case, you find principals who really care about their teachers, who really care about their students, uh, who really understand uh, that they need to provide this very different experience for their kids, for these uh, children that are growing up in poverty. Uh, they aren't, you find a lot of these principals are not charismatic very much, but they're strong leaders, they're sort of iron-fisted sometimes. Uh, a lot of them are using data-informed decision-making. We find that in Texas we have a lot of data, a lot of uh, information out there, so when we use this data to help kids, it works. And then in every single case, uh, they've created a culture of very high expectations. Um, so here's the, the whole extended learning time, high expectations, it's sort of a repeat. Uh, but also confronting this, the stigma of a life of, of poverty, uh, doing things like the uh, school breakfast program, not creating a stigma. There was a time uh, in some schools, and it still exists in some, that if you were the, the poor kid, you would go down to the cafeteria. And even if 80% of the kids in the school were growing up in poverty, you wouldn't want to go down to the cafeteria for free breakfast because you would be the poor kid. And so when you change that to universal school breakfast, where everyone's getting it, then no one's going to deny a free meal. And then also, the whole idea of of, of breakfast being served in the classroom, which we're doing in Dallas, in Houston, and in a number of other cities around Texas where we serve that free breakfast in that first classroom. Uh, kids, kids love that. We, we, were, <coughs> we were just starting to do that in Houston ISD, and New York City was doing the, the, the exact same thing. Uh, and the New York Times ran this article uh, talking about the free breakfast in the classroom, and, and a parent saying, well, I don't like the idea that children are going to have breakfast at school. I want to feed them breakfast, and so uh, I give my son breakfast at, at home, and then I send him to school, and he says no to free breakfast. And then they ask the child, well, when you're offered free breakfast, what do you say? Is, it's free breakfast. Of course I say yes. <laughs> so, uh, so time and time again, you know, kids are the right thing. But then parents go on and say, well, that's why we have childhood obesity. You know, <laughs> 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 this is uh, the rates of uh, secondary education attainment in, by other countries. You get an idea of how far behind we are. You see, um, Texas is right, right in, I mean, the United States is right. In the uh, this is a great chart. Uh, this is uh, uh, a guy named Larry Kellner, who used to be the CEO of Continental Airlines, uh, was one who showed this uh, to me. And uh, he was a big proponent also of the whole idea of higher education. And when you look at 
those that are filing for unemployment and those that have unemployment. Uh, one of the things that we understand is that uh, the, the lower your education, so if you are, you know, you don't have any high school or you're a high school graduate, these are people that are less likely to file for unemployment, right? So these are people that sometimes is not, are not counted by uh, the unemployment system. Yeah, even when we do, even though they don't file and so they can't be counted, the ones that do file, when we look at the rates of unemployment, we see very high levels of unemployment. So this, probably indeed, this is more like this. Uh, but by, by and large, if you have a degree, college degree, or some bachelor's degree, you have lower unemployment. And this was uh, pretty well into the recession that we were seeing this. Uh, and then this is the level of participation in the unemployment program. But, so, but what, what we found by doing this is that uh, so full employment is considered around 4%. And so if, even during the Great Recession, if you had a bachelor's degree, there was still only about 4% uh, unemployment. And by and large, those were new graduates. So we see new graduates are going to have a higher level of unemployment as they look for a job. But we saw significant, we, you can see significant amounts of employment the more education that you have. And so this is one of the things that we try, without showing this chart to, to, to students, it's one of the things that policymakers need to understand is that the more education that the, our children get, the, lo the less likely they will be unemployed. Uh, this is exactly what I was just talking about. Uh, about 60% of our jobs uh, need some sort of higher education, whether it be an associate or uh, a master's. Yet only 31% of Texas adults have something, have this degree, and I think Yeah, this, this bottom study, which is a really interesting study, only 22% of Texas eighth graders, we followed them for uh, after two years after doing a, a two-year degree or two years after completing a four-year degree, so a total of six years, only 22% of eighth graders were getting some form of higher education. And the rate of, of uh, dropouts was, was quite significant as well as we, as we looked at that. So, we put a lot of pressure on our kids to finish middle school, to go to high school, to graduate from high school, and to go on to college. Uh, and the majority of those kids are going to two-year schools, yet the number of kids who graduate from those two-year schools is significantly lower. So it's one of the problems that uh, we have to work on really all across the country, is making sure that as we push children through the system, as we push students through the system, that we do everything possible to make sure that they graduate. The New York Times had a great uh, cover story in the New York Times Magazine just this past Sunday, where they followed a group of Texas kids at the University of Texas. I'm sure you saw that. It was a great story about how the University of Texas has really transformed the way when you have some of these kids who could potentially be at risk of sort of taking care of them, personalizing their education uh, to make sure that they're successful. Uh, I'm going to try to finish up here and open it up to questions. Uh, this gives you an idea of some of the top performing uh, colleges in regards to dropouts. Uh, UT Austin has the highest percentage of uh, kids who graduate here in the state of Texas at 80% of a public school. Rice University is a private school, 91%. Um, let me talk a little bit about uh, adequate nutrition. I've talked about uh, school breakfast before, but still there's a significant amount of schools of food insecurity that we find all across uh, the state of Texas. Uh, by maximizing school lunch and breakfast programs, by maximizing food stamps, we can do a lot more on the state of Texas and nationally in making sure that we get some of that. But the other thing that we're doing is really making sure that in many of our cities we have access to good food. In many of our cities we have a lot of food deserts, uh, which are places where there isn't easy access to supermarkets, uh, there's no easy access uh, to fresh produce, uh, and so we have worked very hard in the state of Texas to make sure that uh, we, can, we can do more of this. And I'll, I'll give you an example. We, we brought together a bunch of supermarkets for this big supermarket summit. And basically, if you saw a map of the greater Houston area, and the same would be true of Dallas, you see huge swaths of land where there's uh, no supermarket anywhere close. And we brought all these supermarkets together. And they're very interested in solving this, but for them it was all about the bottom line. And then we brought in this guy who ran a, uh, 
uh, chain of supermarkets in Philadelphia. And he talked to the, the supermarkets about how you can market yourself to high poverty populations and make money. And that was, that was the right language to speak to Texas supermarkets, right? This is you can go into these poor areas, you can sell fresh produce, and you can make money. And they were very excited about that. And one of the large chains in Texas, HEB, really grabbed onto that. They went to Philadelphia to see what was happening. And they launched a new sort of design, basically, so that they could put some of these supermarkets uh, in some of these areas. So it's sort of a market-driven way to solve access to healthy, to healthy food. Texas has the highest number of uninsured uh, people in the nation. Houston has the highest number for our city. Uh, and, and God forbid we agree to expansion of Medicaid here in the state of Texas. Uh, but one of the things that we're looking at, at least with children, we've, we've come a long way in terms of uh, access to affordable health care. One of the things that we are working on right now is the idea that what if we established uh, within many of our larger schools a federally qualified health clinic. The idea of putting a health clinic uh, within the school, so that becomes the family health clinic right there in the schools, right where the children are. Uh, and what if we did behavioral counseling, psychological counseling, as well as uh, physical health. So a lot of work going on in that area right now. Uh, close to 400,000 children in, our, in foster care. Uh, a lot of work to be done on that. And in, in Houston, we still see, and in, in Dallas, we still see a lot of our children that age out of foster care, that end up on our streets. Uh, foster children, obviously, are the kids getting the, the shortest end of the stick. We see this day in and day out. But when we talk about child welfare, one of the things where we're getting a lot of traction uh, amongst both political parties, many, many times for different reasons, is the idea of what if we made parenting a public policy? What if every child that were born uh, the parents were not only offered as they are now, they're offered breastfeeding classes when the babies are born, birthing classes before they're born. What if they were offered parenting classes? And what if along the lifespan of a child, you know, when you hit the terrible two, twos, there's like a booster shot for parenting. <laughs> what if when you hit kindergarten, you get a little bit more parenting? How about those hormonal years in middle school, more, more parenting needed? And, and once we talk to parents about this, especially first-time parents, they get very excited about this. And what if this became our public policy? This would be so much less expensive than treating uh, all the ailments that ail our kids that are because of the lack of parenting. And parents really want this, especially, again, first-time parents love the idea <coughs> excuse me, of parenting. The Catholic diocese in Houston, we've been working with them, they have decided that from now on, every child who is baptized in the Catholic Diocese will have to go through one of our evidence-based parenting programs. <laughs> and we're very excited about that whole idea that, uh, that we can get parenting out to this larger population. So there's a lot to do in terms of uh, parenting education, but it's very important for us that it be evidence-based, that it be positive, and that it not be a punitive thing. Right now, parenting, is focused right now, you know, if you go through a, a bad divorce or something, if there's child maltreatment, then you're mandated parenting class. It's punitive. Parenting should not be a punitive thing. It should be something that uh, everyone wants to learn about. And so as we talk about ending poverty, making sure children have access to everything needed for them to be successful, for us, we go to Austin, and we like to have these broad conversations uh, with our public officials. And we want to make sure that, uh, that, that we're doing everything possible to, to let every child succeed. And, and I recently went on a, a road trip with, with my daughter. Uh, my daughter graduated from college, and she now lives in New York. She's uh, at Upright Citizens Brigade, but she's doing like improv in, in New York. And she's not even funny, so I don't understand. <laughs> so, uh, Man, you don't ever tell me I said that. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I went on this road trip with her, and, and uh, we went up to Maine, and uh, we had a lot of lobster rolls. It was fantastic. Uh, but one of the songs, she's really good at sort of picking out songs. She said, Dad, you might like this song. And one of the songs that was on was uh, the song Brave, which I, I hadn't really heard from Sarah Bareilles, you know. And all about sort of speaking out 
uh, letting your words speak out and being brave enough to, to say what you believe. And for us in the state of Texas, it's getting more and more people to sort of break from ideology and just be brave about saying, we need to do better by our children. We need to do a lot more to make sure that our children are successful. What a waste for a child. What a waste for all the friends that I had growing up who were smarter than I were that didn't go to college, uh, or my sister who's now working as a bartender. You know, what about all those people that had the ability to do so much uh, and they're not? And all these kids, these six million children in the state of Texas, are we maximizing their potential or are they gonna be economic assets which are completely underused? And so I ask people time and time again to be brave and to make sure that we're doing everything possible. And I, I know that you guys do this work and you do this research and I applaud you for that and I thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much.